I didn't know you were an artist. There's quite a lot about me you don't know. Uh, yeah. No kidding. We get your arc in a general sense, Mel, if that is your real name. But there's so many little details in your scenes that our attention is unmistakably called to. There's something going on there, but we're given nothing. Biggest example? Kino. Who? I know, right? Kino says war is a failure of statecraft. Your brother thinks he can talk his way out of anything. Kino, Mel's brother. He is apparently really, really important to her, and this news about him is shocking enough to totally throw her off balance, which we rarely see happen to Mel. Clearly significant. Or, big glaring example, literally, this thing on her back that glows that she sleeps in must be meaningful. This guy and his giant moving castle seems important. And the other big one, the paintings. And yeah, I know you think I mean this one, which is shown three times, but no, I said paintings. There are two paintings in the show, and the other one is pretty important too, we'll get to it. The flashback also has a lot of nuance, lots of stuff I missed the first 5,000 times I watched the show. But I want to start with Mel's brother because this seems so important we get just so little information about it. So what do we know about this character? Kino says war is a failure of statecraft. This already tells us so much. First it tells us that Mel looks up to her brother. She's the one who brings this up. It's an opinion of her brother, but she's saying it as her own. As far as the opinion itself, it's also very interesting. It tells us that Kino was not a pacifist, but he avoided war when he could in favor of what? Your brother thinks he can talk his way out of anything. Her brother was not a ruthless warrior, but a ruthless diplomat. And this is apparently enough for Ambessa's standards. She just thinks his approach is incomplete. He fancies himself a fox among the wolves, but mark me, child, if you want to last in this world, you must learn to be both the fox and the wolf. So that's interesting. Kino doesn't like war. He completely disagrees with his mother's glorification of it, but he doesn't get disowned. You said, Perhaps your sentimentality will be more at home with those soft-spined idealists overseas. So we see an important distinction in the Medarda ethic. Aggression is good, more aggression is better, but it's not a question of warlike versus unwarlike. War is better, but the aggression can be in other arenas as well. As long as you don't show sentimentality, softness, you get to stay in the family. Kino's approach is what Mel clearly models herself after once she has been exiled. Your brother thinks he can talk his way out of anything. That's Mel. That's what she does best. She talks, she manipulates, she maneuvers, she wins through commercial warfare, not actual warfare. And when she does advocate for war, it does seem like a last effort, but at the same time, she rejects Jace's softness and tries to get him to make the decisions necessary to protect their people. And it's going fine, but then something unexpected happens. And when I say unexpected, I mean for Mel in Starry, but it's also a really interesting device from a writing perspective. Just to set the stage here, Mel arc starts really late in the series. It's seven full episodes of a character being extremely active, extremely relevant, impactful, plot-wise, character-wise, thematically. She has a lot of motivation for sure as well, but there's no conflict. She's not struggling with anything, there's no arc. There's a character moment or two, or maybe just one actually. But then her mom shows up and Mel comes alive. We see a whole lot of conflict and her arc begins. And this relationship with her mom stands in contrast to most of what we see in the rest of the series. Parental guidance is cherished in Arcane. It's something we see the characters struggle to live up to or to decide between. We do see Caitlin harbor resentment, but it's nothing compared to Mel. With Mel, we see a much more vehement hatred, a disgust almost. Definitely a grudge against her mother. And for good reason too. Mel's mother disowned her, obviously. That's a big one. But also, Ambessa's whole personality is this blunt weapon. She's callous. She throws her weight around. She's impossible to talk to. And she's indulgent, all of which is distasteful to Mel. Mel, who's refined, who's subtle, who guards her secrets, who never quite says what she means. But at the same time, what does she see her mother doing in this visit? Being ruthlessly manipulative, for selfish reasons, couched in protective language, pushing for exactly what Mel was pushing for one episode ago, that same course of action, even the same arguments for that course of action. What changes Mel's course isn't some opposing force on an opposing path, it's having a character come who's on the same path. I thought this was really interesting. Gaining what on paper could be an ally is what creates conflict for Mel, someone who mirrors her. That's what I think Howell is doing here. It's interesting, when my dad watched Arcane, Mel came off as sociopathic to him. My dad, by the way, a psychiatrist at maximum security prison, so he's familiar with the type. He was very skeptical about any genuine feelings Mel might have for Jace, since relationships for sociopaths are commonly exploitative, and we do see the motive for that with Mel. I disagree, I think she's genuine with her relationship, but the question was interesting to me. And I think Mel sees Howell, and she has the same question about herself. She sees her mother, acting all rich and important, manipulating everyone around her, pushing for hextech weaponry, pursuing younger men, and I don't know if Jace is actually younger, but he's lower on the totem pole for sure, and I think it honestly freaks her out. What she's seeing is a more blatant, almost grotesque version of herself. It's a foreshadowing of what she fears she's becoming. Miss Medarda. Yes. yes. And that notion is an absolute nightmare for Mel, and I mean that literally. Remember, her flashback is not a flashback, it's an actual nightmare. I'm not saying it's a dream, it's inaccurate, I think this is a device so that they could do this. Notice the painting. This is the other painting I mentioned, by the way. We see that even after all these years, her mother's blood-soaked ethics haunt her. She not only made this, she puts it above her bed. It looms over her like a warning. So we've got Ambessa and we've got Kino. Two approaches, both Noxian, the fox, and the wolf. Mel is traumatized by the latter. She adopts the former. And then what happens? Your brother's gone. 
he died. His approach didn't work. And Bessa's visit makes Mel realize she's becoming more wolfish in her approach, more like her mother, and that horrifies her. But equally devastating is the realization that she can't retreat to what she was doing before. The aggressive diplomacy of her brother, who she always looked up to, the fox's approach, that also won't work. So what does she do now? Nothing works. Okay, so let's talk about the other painting. And you'll see this is all consistent with what we've been saying about her trajectory until this point, before her mom arrives. There's a lot being conveyed in the scene symbolically. Mel violently grinding the ingredients of her paint, slashing it onto the canvas with a palette knife, a noticeably weapon-like painting of a mint. And the paint itself is blood red. We're seeing violence symbolized here. And I think the surface level meaning we're supposed to get from this is that she's angry at Jace for leaving in the middle of the night, but there's more here. The paint is blood red, but more importantly, it's Medarda red. And look at the painting. A fleet of Medarda ships, and in the background, the immortal bastion of Noxus. She's painting a glorious scene of her family in her homeland. At this point in her arc, before her mother arrives, Noxus and the Medarda clan still dominate her standards for glory. And they do this, I think, for the contrast. This whole time until now, she's been pushing all out for more Hextech, cast caution to the wind, manipulate everyone in my path, and she'll keep doing that beyond the scene, but this is the first time we see something different from her. Jace opens up about Victor's condition. He has this moment of vulnerability, and in response, she has this moment of gentleness, empathy, softness. That's the relationship, and it's why I don't think it's exploitative at all. Just like I explained in my video about Vi and Kate, the romantic relationships in Arcane are about shared principles on a deeply personal level. Mel never stopped being the sentimental softy her mom cast out. Jace reawakens that protective idealism in her, and I think that's at the heart of her attraction to him. Even though he proves himself to be fairly malleable, fairly Plato-like when it comes to how he decides to solve his problems on a given day, deep down he values exactly what she values. Helping people, protecting them, mercy. There's a lot of relevance to colors in Arcane. A lot has been said about eye color, the contrast between the pink of Shimmer and the blue of Hextech. Verzana and Piltover, it's the war between the pink and the blue, until the fateful mix of the two in the finale anyway. For Mel, it's an inner war, and it's between red and gold. And now the time has come to talk about Mel's back. <laughs> This has been the subject of a lot of speculation. Jinx's missile is heading right for the council. Something on Mel's back lights up. We see the glass break, season ends. I mentioned this in my cliffhanger video and I got a lot of comments saying it's nothing. It's just light reflecting from the missile. Just a, just a glimmer of light, no significance to it at all. It could just as easily not been there, which is just wrong. Because A, it's not how fiction works. You don't draw attention in an unusual form to something ambiguous if it's not worthy of that attention. This detail has to be significant. And B, there's no light coming from the missile. So it doesn't make sense anyway. This is Mel using magic in some form. I spec in the video that she herself was using magic, but after hearing more about League lore, it seems more likely that she's in possession of a magical item. And like I mentioned earlier, we see with her when she's in bed with Jace, she's not wearing anything else, but this gold thing is still there. Either she always wears it, so why? Or it's like grafted to her skin, also why? So I'm not a League expert, but there's speculation that it's this, the locket of the Iron Solari. In League, this item protects surrounding allies. It's possible that Mel's family is related to the Solari, a religious order that venerates the sun. That's the reason for the golden light, the golden color. But just wait, it's gonna get a bit deeper than that, okay? So go back to the fox and the wolf, Mel is trauma by one, and now she's seen that the other has failed. Both red approaches. What's left? Nothing, right? So, no, there's also one more approach we heard thrown into this whole mix. It was Mel's approach as a kid, the approach of mercy, peace, asserting control by nonviolent means. And how does Mel introduce this approach? We'll paint the walls in gold. It was not the red Noxine way of war, it was Mel's own way. In Mel's final scene, she votes for peace, breaking with her Noxine background. Look what she does to her painting. She paints over the red of Medarda with gold. The gold represents Mel acting for herself, her own unique approach, her nindo, her ninja way. Mercy, protecting life. The gold comes up as a child when she wants to protect life, the gold comes up as an adult when she votes to protect life, and the gold protects her life, I think in a karmic way. Once she rediscovers this aspect of her uniquely her, once she becomes the protector, once she casts aside the red and chooses gold, she earns the unique protection of the gold. Something interesting here, and again, something full of secrets and mysteries, as Mel is, is the Medarda family name, the clan. There's a lot of disagreement about clan Medarda and the lore and what's canon in the game, and if the show is changing that. What everyone agrees on is that the Medarda clan as a family has long had ties to Piltover. In the game, as I understand it, they're straight at Piltover nobility, and they're not a warrior clan. And they do have ties to Noxus at some point in their history, but they're a mercantile clan who developed Piltover Sungates. Sun, again, by the way, gold. We don't know exactly exactly when the show takes place on the timeline of Minarda history, but it does seem like the show has set things up differently, and I've seen different versions out there. Maybe she's Noxine but has family ties to Piltover, maybe her dad is from Piltover. The version I like the best is that the Medardas had nothing to do with Piltover before Mel. She's exiled to basically this random city her mom thinks is weak, and Mel not only builds it up, but she establishes a Medarda as a noble family here anew. She is the matriarch of this new legacy of Piltover Medardas, who stand apart from Noxine Medardas. What a beautiful triumph it would be for her character to be disowned from her family, only to create 
create a new line more powerful and richer and more virtuous than the Barbarian Medardas ever were. There's something so incredible about how they chose to express these themes of this character. The stuff with the gold, the paintings, the brother, all these easy to miss references and incomplete hints. With other characters, and I think Jinx is a perfect example, Jinx is this very loud theatrical character. So the tools they give us to understand her character are also very loud and theatrical. Mel is mysterious, she's secretive. The way she speaks is full of hidden meanings and motivations, so the tools to understand her arc are also secretive, mysterious, hidden. The aesthetics of the arc match the character, so well executed. By the way, hopefully this video shed some light on my controversial evaluation of Mel in the alignment video. I aligned her with her mom, partly because of what I said in this video. She's becoming her mom until episode 8. That doesn't take away from how much respect I have for this character, for realizing the direction she was heading, and slamming on the brakes, changing course. Whether or not she changed in time, the kind of strength Mel has to make a decision like that, to believe in her own way, the mercy that she's been condemned for her whole life, to embrace that and shine with that. It's some true fortitude, some of the strongest we see in the whole show. Incredible journey for this character. I want to make this video about Mel, partially because most of what I've seen out there, for myself included, is basically about Jinx and Vi, some Silco. But let me know what you want to see explored with the lesser talked about characters. I'd love to know what people find compelling and what questions people have about the whole rest of the cast. So leave a comment about that, subscribe while you're at it, click like. I watched Cobra Kai season four with my family this week and had some thoughts on Terry Silver, so I made a video about that on Friday. Check that out if you're a fan of the show. Other arcane stuff available to watch as well. Patreon people, thanks as always. Support me on there if you wish. Check out my superhero parody webcomic, Minor Champion, if you like webtoons. New videos every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. Thanks for watching.